How do you feel about turning 30? If you already have, how was it for you? Turning 30 seems to be one of life's key milestones. It's that moment when it suddenly dawns on us, hashtag adulting. It's time to live the grown-up life. I asked social media friends to complete this sentence. You know you're 30 when? Here's how some of them replied. You know you're 30 when you try and get the cashier to age verify you. You know you're 30 when you get excited about negotiating a cheaper utility bill. You know you're 30 when somebody steams past you in the fast lane and you sit comfortably in the slow lane, smug knowing that you're getting more miles per gallon. You know you're 30 when you've looked up what a gallon is. You know you're 30 when you no longer dress for the catwalk, but instead dress to walk cats. You're no longer 30 when you look in the mirror and you start to see your mum or your dad. Hashtag adulting. Ezekiel had turned 32. He was all set to become a priest. His dad was a priest. His dad's dad was a priest. His dad's dad dad was a priest. There was no doubt that he was going to become a priest too. Have you felt that expectation of others that you will follow in the family business just because that's the path that others have mapped out for you? Or maybe you've struggled with the idea of being a Christian because previous generations of your family have all been Christians and the expectation is that you will, whether you want to or not. Ezekiel had that expectation too. But now things hadn't quite worked out as planned. You see, in his mid-twenties, he had been apprenticing in order to become a priest in Jerusalem. But whilst there, the feared Babylonians led by King Nebuchadnezzar had invaded and they had taken captive 10,000 or more people, trafficked them back to Babylon, Ezekiel being one of them. Five years later, on his 30th birthday, he was sitting down by the river. This should have been the day, according to Numbers chapter 4, when he would have had his first official duty as a priest. You could only be a priest officially from the age of 30 and above. But instead, all of that has been taken away. It's not just as his freedom has been taken, but all his life and all his expectations, his identity, have all been taken too. What was all that about? Where was it all heading? And what about now? Where is my life going now? What have I come to and where am I heading? Hashtag adulting all of a sudden didn't seem that great. But Ezekiel was about to discover that God had a different plan for him. You see, Ezekiel, he might have thought he was on the path to become a priest and that wasn't happening now. But instead, he was going to become a prophet. You see, there were tens of thousands of priests, so many that we don't have a list of them. But by becoming a, pro a prophet, Ezekiel got a book in the Bible, the book of Ezekiel that we're going to be studying during February and March. Ezekiel got a book in the Bible. Wow, way to go. So down by the river, Ezekiel's got questions and he's wondering what was all that about. He's got regrets, he's got disappointment. And yet he starts to daydream. And verse 1 says, The heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. It was as if the sky was torn in two and revealing a whole different dimension. Imagine you go to the theatre and you're waiting for the performance to start. And then suddenly the lights dim and the curtains are drawn back to reveal a whole different world behind. That world had already existed before. It had just been covered up by the curtains. So it was that Ezekiel was seeing behind the curtains of the sky to a whole nother realm, the spiritual realm, heaven. And it was mesmerizing for Ezekiel the heavens were opened 
and I saw visions of God. Now, this would have messed big time with Ezekiel's head. I mean, first of all, people thought then that God was so holy, he would never ever have anything to do with his creation. God would remain distant, far off, aloof. But Ezekiel was seeing visions of God. And secondly, wasn't God supposed to be in Jerusalem? Wasn't God supposed to be there? Not here, in, in Babylon. I mean, more than that, God was meant to be in a wooden box. I mean, hear me out. People had this idea that you needed to have a visual way of, con of conceptualising God. So they had a wooden box. And wherever that wooden box went, the wooden box being the Ark of the Covenant, so God's presence was said to be. As long as people were by this wooden box, they were by God. If they were away from that wooden box, then they were away from God. And that wooden box, after the journeying of the Israelites, had ended up being centrepiece in the Holy of Holies in the temple in Jerusalem. That's where God resided. That's why people would travel huge distances on pilgrimage to come for the festivals to worship. They were coming to God, going from there to here. And as far as Ezekiel was concerned, God was meant to be in that box, in Jerusalem, in the temple, and that was 500 or more miles away. He definitely wasn't supposed to be in, of all places, Babylon. Babylon, the place symbolising the antithesis of God, the opposite of God. Why would God be there? Surely God would be in his temple, physical building structure in Jerusalem. Have you ever wondered, is God really with me? I, I know he's supposed to be over there in that place, that church building even. But what about with me? What about with you right here, right now? We're going to discover, as Ezekiel discovered, that God is here too, not just over there. You see, the existence of God isn't dependent on whether you or I believe in him. It's great that we do, but whether we do or not doesn't alter one moment whether God exists. God exists because he exists not because you and I think of him or have some religious notions about him. Ezekiel could see a storm cooking up and it was coming from the north. Coming from the north because that's often where God was symbolised as coming from, but also the place from judgment where that too came from. And at the centre of the storm, Ezekiel saw four living creatures. I mean, they were a mix of human animal and bird. We're talking the stuff of the Lord of the Rings. Uh, like men, these four living creatures stood together, four to form a square shape. Like birds, they each had wings, not just two, but four wings each. Like animals, they had what were described as young bull's legs. I mean, there's plenty of people I know who have got really uh, fine calf muscles and of bronze legs. These are described as cows or calves legs and a bronze shaped feet. So they're like animals too. Now you've got a face. You know some people that are two-faced but these guys they had four faces. Their four faces were of a man, a lion, an ox and an eagle. And if you like, they can symbolise different aspects of humanity. For example, the man speaking of our vulnerability, our humility, our wisdom, coming at the front. The lion speaking of assertiveness, authority, courage. The ox of um, toil, persistence, servanthood. The eagle of soaring, of vision of seeing things from a different heavenly perspective. All of these four were best in category. The eagle, the best of the, of the bird kingdom. 
the ox, the best of the domesticated animals, the lion, the king of the wild beasts, and humanity, the king of all creation. Whichever creature you faced, the human face always faced you first. But it also meant that whichever one you looked at, you, whether you always saw not only the human face, but you saw all the other faces, all the different dimensions at the same time too. And later on in chapter 10, Ezekiel describes these living creatures as being cherubim, angels if you like. Now, when we think of angels, we often think of light, fluffy, dainty ones that kind of prance around with tutus and so forth. We got that all wrong. In the Old Testament, angels, cherubim, these were hardcore tough nuts. Think more SAS, special angel service. You don't mess with these guys. They are the enforcers. They are bold. And at the center of these four creatures, the SAS, there were burning hot coals. Now, to move, each had bronze cow's feet, hooves. But they also had a wheel each. And it was more than that, this was some proper customized kind of supercar, super fan type modification because the wheel each had another wheel within it, a wheel within a wheel. And that meant it could go in any direction. This was some all terrain type structure vehicle. And not only that, it had pimped up rims and special diamond studded glittery paintwork. We're talking proper modified vehicle going on here. And it could go anywhere because the wheels within a wheel meant it could go in any direction. The hooves meant that it could climb in any uh, steep uh, terrain. And then with wings, it could fly as well. It was a go anywhere place. Symbolizing that there is nowhere this could not go. That also means that God is saying that he is the go anywhere God. Go anywhere to you. Go anywhere with you. There is nowhere that you can go or be or even hide where God cannot be. And you say, well, you don't know how tough my workplace is. The all-terrain God goes with you. You don't know how difficult my home life is. The all-terrain God goes to you too. He goes anywhere. Now, it talks of four living creatures, four faces, four wings and so forth. God is saying that he is all over the four corners of the globe. He is the Lord of all. In verses 12 and then repeated again in verse 20, wherever the spirit would go, they would go. This is an early reference to God being spirit. God the Holy Spirit who reveals the spirit of Christ within us. The God who is everywhere becoming somewhere in us, in Jesus Christ, in his spirit. God is with us right now. Now, people used to think about religious artefacts, statues and so forth. But Ezekiel is beginning to realise that this God is dynamic. He is on the move. He's constantly evolving, changing, adapting and so forth. Interacting. How does that match with your vision of God, your experience of the divine? When you think of God, is God static, unchanging? Or is God constantly adapting and evolving and interacting with you and around you, making change in circumstances through your prayers? Wow. And on the throne was the appearance of a figure like that of a man. And we're going to see that actually all of this is so symbolic of God coming from heaven to earth. The incarnation, God coming in Jesus Christ. How shocking then was that to think that God would leave this safety, the security, the holiness of heaven to step into the mess that is creation, the created world, which he does. In Jesus Christ. So are you getting all of this? Are you picturing all the different dynamic things that are going on around at the moment? Are you ever woken from a dream and thought how on earth do I explain that one? 
You see, Ezekiel is trying to find language and he's struggling, but he's doing his best to describe what he's seeing and experiencing. So he talks of what looks like, what sounded like, it had the appearance of, well, it was a bit like this, it was a bit like that. In other words, no language is ever quite complete enough or rich enough or beautiful enough to quite capture fully all the characteristics of God. But it doesn't stop us trying because we want to communicate something to others as well as to give glory to God. So there was this appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. The, the Hebrew word that's used here is kavod. It's got a sense of heaviness, of a, a significance. The glory of God is the overwhelming presence of God and it almost feels heavy, heavy. Do you ever have that moment when it feels like the air itself is heavy? That there is a heavy atmosphere about. It sometimes sends a tingling sensation up or down our spine. Wow, something's happening here. Oh, I just feel that. Wow. That's what Ezekiel is feeling. He's feeling the heaviness of God, the presence of God overwhelming in this moment. And we experience God in the present too. Yes, we remember God and all that he has done in the past, our recent past, or going way back into the scriptures. And we anticipate what God will do in the future with us. But it's in the present that we experience God in the here and the now. And right now, God is with you, whether you realise it or not. And sometimes that dawns on us and we suddenly wake up and we have that overwhelming sense of, wow, and surely God is in this place. No wonder that chapter 1 ends with Ezekiel saying, when I saw it, Whatever it is, he's, big, he's run out of adjectives, he's run out of descriptive words. Whatever, when I saw it, I fell face down. What else could he do but bow down in awe? Ezekiel was beginning to realise that God is all terrain. The go anywhere God, no matter what his situation whether he's in Jerusalem, in the holy place, or whether he's in Babylon, in captivity. The same goes for you too. He's realising that there is nowhere out of reach for God. The same goes for you too today. That God is present right here, right now. He is that with you, right here, right now. And that turning 30 can be the start of a new direction, a new purpose in life, full of surprises, maybe not quite meeting all the original expectations, but different and even better. I saw the heavens opened and visions of God. Over these next two months, as we work our way through the book of Ezekiel, let that be our prayer too, that we too see heaven opened and the visions of God. This isn't the end, it's the start of something, the beginning of something. It's the start of the beginning as we journey towards what God has for us. Let's adventure together. Bless you.